Okay, good morning class. Today we are going to be recording Lit Speed Building. And so it's a long answer. So the question is, what would you have done differently in how the claim was handled by the insurance companies? And so you've got aggressive, insured, buckling, resolution, consequential, perfect glass or perfect plastic company, decla declaratory judgment, plastic panels, Harris Glass Company, documentation, insurance, retrospect, bankruptcy, coverage, and exposed. And so this is going to be the answer, and it's going to be at 170, you all. 170. We are looking at the present compared to what was back then. I would have liked to have seen a much more aggressive investigation into it, a much more aggressive position of making things happen and pushing this thing towards a resolution. In retrospect, the $200,000, obviously, when we look at this at this point in time, that was probably a steal. I imagine defense costs will be close to that by this time for everything involved. I think that looking back with the way things are now, that there should have been a much more aggressive investigation pushing this thing towards a conclusion and getting it resolved. By an aggressive investigation, I mean someone needed to determine why the plastic panels were failing, what the supportive documentation would be for the portion of the loss which we were aware would be covered under the policy. This was prior to knowing that the consequential damages would be covered under the Plastic Perfect Company's general liability policy. So I suppose in looking at the panels, <clears throat> for whatever reason, were not what they were supposed to be. They were buckling. I drove by the project and looked at it, saw that they were buckling. I think we should have gotten into it earlier, gotten a resolution to that, and moved forward with resolving it later on. I think the end result of the two insurance companies paying money to get this thing resolved eventually was what should have been done a long time ago. And then get into the dispute about what happened and who did what to whom. So I would just have pushed it a lot further, a lot faster. We left our insured hanging out there for quite a period of time, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing where things were going. If we had a concern about coverages, we should have filed a declaratory judgment against and got them resolved very early on. We should have known what was going on out there and worked based upon that. But the fact that the case was not settled early on obviously exposed our insured to a risk at that point in time. Ultimately, I guess the Plastic Perfect Company didn't pay anything out of their pocket in the case. They haven't really been damaged, but they were certainly out there at a time when they were in bankruptcy. Obviously, we have spent a lot of money, and so has your client spent a lot of money on defense costs and on the determination as to whose coverage is primary. I just think that it would have been a lot cheaper a long time ago, and certainly when we had this, in a position where the case could have been settled. There should have been a lot more activity going on getting a resolution. We probably could have resolved it on behalf of the Plastic Perfect Company first. Then I think that it might have been worked out by a fair discussion. We will take this portion, you will take that portion, etc. We could proceed in doing whatever was necessary in order to settle the case either with the building owner or with Harris Glass or whoever, by moving forward to closure. Settle the thing finally, get it over and done with. But we kind of sat in our own little world on this saying there is no coverage for the work product. The product's carrier said they didn't think there was coverage because of these facts and those facts. And we all kind of sat around and thought, well, gee, maybe there is no liability anyway because of the way the Harris Glass hung those panels. I think that between the three of us, had we got very aggressive and pushed it, that the case could have been resolved a long time ago. And it may have been the $200,000, which frankly looks like a heck of a bargain right now. I say again, I think it could have been done if we'd been more aggressive and pushed it harder. I think it was a decision of lying back to see if someone else was going to pay. There is also the other part, too, that the industry, the claims industry, has changed a lot in the last five years. 
I think we take a much more aggressive posture on these things now as far as getting them resolved. So you attorneys don't keep getting richer. We just take a harder and faster procedure. There is an old saying that there are three types of people. There are those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. And at that point in time, I think we were watching things happen rather than making things happen. And today, I think it would be a situation where we would be out there making things happen instead of the other way around. I think it was a conscious decision to see what develops, see what happens. I mean, we were not as aggressive back. And so words that come out, you have, um, let me see, $1,000 is $100,000. Let me see if that came out. Yeah, you've got uh, supportive is sport if. You have resolution is resolution. What else? Um, ultimately is ultimately. You have. Determination is D-E-R-M-G-S. You have insurance companies is SNRC come back S. You have coverage, K-O-V-R-J. And this is gonna be 180. We are looking at the present compared to what was back then. I would have liked to have seen a much more aggressive investigation into it a much more aggressive position of making things happen and pushing this thing towards a resolution. In retrospect, the $200,000, obviously, when we look at this, at this point in time, that was probably a steal. I imagine defense costs will be close to that time by this time for everything involved. I think that looking back with the way things are now, that there should have been a much more aggressive investigation pushing this thing towards a conclusion and getting it resolved. By an aggressive investigation, I mean someone needed to determine why the plastic panels were failing, what the supportive documentation would be for the portion of the loss, which we were aware would be covered under the policy. This was prior to knowing that the consequential damages would be covered under the Plastic Perfect Company's general liability policy. So I suppose in looking at it, the panels for whatever reason, were not what they were supposed to be. They were buckling. I drove by that project and looked at it, saw that they were buckling. I think we should have gotten into it earlier, gotten a resolution to that and move forward with resolving it later on. I think the end result of the two insurance companies paying money to get this thing resolved eventually was what should have been done a long time ago. And then get into the dispute about what happened and who did what to whom. So I would have just pushed it a lot further, a lot faster. We left our insured hanging out there for quite a period of time, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing where things were going. If we had a concern about coverages, we should have filed a declaratory judgment action and got them resolved very early on. We should have known what was going on out there and worked based upon that. But the fact that the case was not settled early on obviously exposed our insured to a risk at that point in time. Ultimately, I guess the Plastic Perfect Company didn't pay anything out of their pocket in the case. They haven't really been damaged, but they were certainly out there at a time when they were in bankruptcy. Obviously, we have spent a lot of money, and so has your client spent a lot of money on defense costs and on the determination as to whose coverage is primary. I just think that it would have been a lot cheaper a long time ago, and certainly when we had this in a position where the case could have been settled, there should have been a lot more activity going on getting resolution. We probably could have resolved it on behalf of the Plastic Perfect Company first. Then I think that it might have been worked out by a fair discussion. We will take this portion, you will take that portion, etc. We could proceed on doing whatever was necessary in order to settle the case, either with the building owner or with Harris Glass or whoever, by moving forward to closure, settle the thing finally, get it over and done. But we kind of sat in our own little world on this, saying there is no coverage for the work product. The products carrier said that 
they didn't think there was coverage because of these facts and those facts. And we all kind of sat around and thought, well, gee, maybe there is no liability anyway because of the way that Harris Glass hung those panels. I think that between the three of us, had we got very aggressive and pushed it, that the case could have been resolved a long time ago. And it may have been the $200,000, which frankly looks like a heck of a bargain right now. I say again, I think it could have been done if we'd been more aggressive and pushed it harder. I think it was a decision of lying back to see if someone else was going to pay. There is also the other part too, that the industry, the claims industry has changed a lot in the last five years. I think we take a much more aggressive posture on these things now as far as getting them resolved. So you attorneys don't keep getting richer. We just take a harder and faster procedure. There is an old saying that there are three types of people. There are those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. And at that point in time, I think we were watching things happen rather than making things happen. And today I think it would be a situation where we would be out there making things happen instead of the other way around. I think it was a conscious decision to see what develops, see what happens. I mean, we were not as aggressive back then in claims handling as we are today. I mean, I speak of that from the industry, from the industry standpoint, so we were not as aggressive. But there was also a conscientious decision to see what developed on this. So conscientious is K-E-R-B-S, conscientious, K-E-R-B-S. You've got situation is S-I-F-P-G-S. -S. You have period of time is P-R-F-T. And then this is going to be at 190, you all. We are looking at the present compared to what was back then. I would have liked to have seen a much more aggressive investigation into it, a much more aggressive position of making things happen and pushing this thing towards a resolution. In retrospect, the $200,000, obviously, when we look at this at this point in time, that was probably a steal. I imagine defense costs will be close to that by this time for everything involved. I think that looking back with the way things are now that there should have been a much more aggressive investigation pushing this thing towards a conclusion and getting it resolved. By an aggressive investigation, I mean someone needed to determine why the plastic panels were failing, what the supportive documentation would be for the portion of the loss which we were aware would be covered under the policy. This was prior to knowing that the consequential damages would be covered under the Plastic Perfect Company's general liability policy. So I suppose in looking at it, the panels for whatever reason were not what they were supposed to be. They were buckling. I drove by the project and looked at it, saw that they were buckling. I think we should have gotten into it earlier, gotten a resolution to that and move forward with resolving it later on. I think the end result of the two insurance companies paying money to get this thing resolved eventually was what should have been done a long time ago. And then get into the dispute about what happened and who did what to who. So I would just have pushed it a lot further, a lot faster. We left our insured hanging there for quite a period of time, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing where things were going. If we had a concern about coverages, we should have filed a declaratory judgment action and got them resolved very early on. We should have known what was going on out there and worked based upon that. But the fact that the case was not settled early on obviously exposed our insured to a risk at that point in time. Ultimately, I guess, the Plastic Perfect Company didn't pay anything out of their pocket in the case. They haven't really been damaged, but they were certainly out there at a time when they were in bankruptcy. Obviously, we have spent a lot of money, and so has your client spent a lot of money on defense costs and on the determination as to whose coverage is primary. I think just that it would have been a lot cheaper a long time ago, and certainly when we had this in a position where the case could have been settled, there should have been a lot more activity going on getting resolution. <clears throat> we probably could have resolved it on behalf of the Plastic Perfect Company first. Then I think that it might have been worked out by a fair discussion. We will take this portion, you will take that portion, etc. We could proceed to doing whatever was necessary in order to settle the case either with the building owner 
or with Harris Glass or whoever by moving forward to closure, settle the thing finally, get it over and done. But we kind of sat in our own little world on this saying there is no coverage for the work product. The product's carrier said that they didn't think there was coverage because of these facts and those facts. And we all kind of sat around and thought, well, gee, maybe there is no liability anyway because of the way that Harris Glass hung those panels. I think that between the three of us, had we got very aggressive and pushed it, that the case could have been resolved a long time ago. And it may have been the $200,000, which frankly looks like a heck of a bargain right now. I say again, I think it could have been done if we'd been more aggressive and pushed it harder. I think it was a decision of lying back to see if someone else was going to pay. There is also the other part too, that the industry, the claims industry has changed a lot in the last five years. I think we take a much more aggressive posture on these things now as far as getting them resolved. So you attorneys don't keep getting richer. We just take a harder and faster procedure. There is an old saying that there are three types of people. There are those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. And at that point in time, I think we were watching things happen rather than making things happen. And today, I think it would be a situation where we would be out there making things happen instead of the other way around. I think it was a conscious decision to see what develops, see what happens. I mean, we were not as aggressive back then in claims handling as we are today. I mean, I speak of that from the industry, from the industry standpoint. So we are not as aggressive, but there was also a conscientious decision to see what developed on this and see what happened on that. I think that we were attempting to press the other hand to see what they were doing and with this coverage and what they were going to do with it. If they come down and say, we are not going to provide any coverage, then we have got some hard decisions to make. Okay, and we'll get ready for your mock you all. If it's not enough speed building, listen to your EV360. And so I'm going to start with one minute lit as warm up, okay? This is going to be one minute lit for practice before your mock. I put those together to find the system that seems to work best for the people I'm working with. The Jenner Center offers four particular necessities to the general population of gender conflicted or cross-dressing people. They offer association, they offer affiliation, they offer information and education. That is our basic charter. Now, the way what we do this is through open group discussions and there are regular meetings held every week. There are three entry level groups for everyone in general. We have a Monday evening group, we have a Thursday Monday group, and we have a Saturday morning group. These groups are for those people who have just found us who may have never been able to talk to anyone about gender before or about their feelings or what they were experiencing. They are able to come in there. It's a renovated older building. We put it together with more of a home-like setting rather than a sterile clinical situation. Our clients can relax in a comfortable atmosphere and talk about their feelings without fear of ridicule or disapproval. This begins to have some therapeutic properties in that it allows them to, and on your 180 lit, you have proper names. It's a long answer and proper names that come out. You have Thanksgiving Day, Labrador Retriever Hunt Club, Base Chaplain, Labrador Retrievers. And the question is, is this the full extent of your husband's mental cruelty? And this is going to be 180 lit for five minutes for your mock. Well, no. During the time when we went to the marriage counselor, the marriage counselor suggested that I ask my husband if he still wanted a divorce. This was about six weeks or better after we had been going to her. And so I asked him one evening and he said he had not changed his mind. Since then, on repeated occasions, he has asked me to get my clothes and move out, that I could move at any time I so desired. Whenever we would have an argument, this would always be the last resort or his last statement. He would say, get your clothes and move out. This was usually his last statement. I have other incidents of his mental cruelty too. You see, 
I knew I would get so upset, so I wrote some things down so I would know what I was talking about. One thing he has found out that bothers me is when he lays on the couch to watch television, that is the only place for us to watch television. He shoves with his feet and puts his feet in my lap to make me move. Whenever he is late for dinner or doesn't come home, he has never called me. I would say maybe on the fingers on one hand is what I would guess is the number of times he has ever called to tell me that he was not coming home for dinner. Also, when we have had company, he has been known to go in the other room and read or read in front of them. Also, on occasion, he has been known to leave by another door and leave the company. When I'd ask him about his comings and goings, he said that was his business, particularly eight to five was his business. When I go anywhere, I am asked where I have been, who I was with, and so forth. Also, there was this thing about his leaves and where he was going and his military occupation. I don't care to know any military secrets, but I would like to know when his leaves are, where he is going, and who he is going with. And I have always had to find that out either by overhearing it when he tells someone else, or maybe someone tells me about it. Also, there have been several instances when we have had company and he has been in his dirty clothes. One time particularly was Thanksgiving Day when the dining room table was set with sterling and fine dishes and we had a guest in our home. He came home from hunting and he had on his dirty hunting clothes. He had taken off his shirt and his thermal underwear was the only shirt that he was wearing. When the table was set with sterling and china for Thanksgiving Day dinner, and a guest was present, I think he should have changed his clothes and cleaned himself up. His manners at the table are most aggravating. He explained to me not long ago that the reason he didn't use his napkin was because he didn't think he would slop his food in his lap. Another instance was when I was sick not very long ago, I had to ride in an ambulance and when I came home, he went out to dinner. He went out to dinner and went to a Labrador Retriever hunt club meeting and left me all by myself. Also, another time about a year and a half or two years ago, I was sick in bed and I had taken my temperature. It was about 104 degrees and he wanted to go back to work at the office. At that time, I told him if he did, I would call the base chaplain. You see? The base chaplain was my old friend I could talk to about my husband and my husband didn't like me calling him. And it was all because he said that he was climbing the ladder fast and didn't want me to be telling everyone about my problems with him. He said, I should be thankful to have a husband like him who made enough money in the family so I wouldn't have to go to work. Also, I have asked him not to bring those great big Labrador retrievers in the house. The youngest one was brought into the kitchen and was kept there while he was a puppy. And when he scratched all the kitchen cabinets with his nails, my husband promised to refinish the cabinets. They are still in the same condition. And when we moved into that house, it was broken and damaged and there were also all kinds of big promises about how he was going to fix it, but he is physically too lazy to do any of the fixing. I feed and carry water twice a day to all the animals. I have also carried 100 pound sacks of feed. There was another time about fixing that house. The screens were all banging or bagging out when we bought it. So after living there about six or seven months, I called a carpenter. He made a bill out or I mean to say an estimate. He told me that it would cost this much to fix all six screens so they didn't bulge. So I called. And then we have one minute at 200 QA for warm up, okay? This is one minute, 200. Jury charge, sorry, jury charge. Members of the jury, you are part of a group of people referred to as the prospective jury panel.
Prior to the voir dire process, I would like to lay some ground rules for you here in court and outside of the courtroom as well. Uh, if you have a cell phone, smartphone, or any other kind of wireless communication device with you, please take it out now and turn it off. During these proceedings, do not turn it on and do not leave it on vibrate. During this process, you must leave all electronics off. Please comply at this time with my request. Failure to follow the rules of the court will lead to a fine and possible expulsion from the courtroom. Now, if you are selected as a juror, the only recording devices, electronic devices and cameras that are allowed in the courtroom will be at my discretion. So please heed my admonition or risk a fine of $100. Now, as far as the proceedings here in this courtroom, you may want to tell friends and family and other people about your experiences here in the trial. Do not do so. You can explain to everyone about, and then you have on your 200 jury charge mock test, you have, just a minute you all. This is gonna be then your 200 jury charge for your mock, no proper names for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there are three elements of the plaintiff's cause of action that are based on negligence. Now, just so you understand, they are being denied by the defendant's answer to the claim. Since the plaintiff is the one who has made these charges against the defendant, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove all three of the elements by a preponderance of the evidence or the greater weight of the evidence. The first element of the cause of action is that the plaintiff must prove that the defendant was negligent in one or more ways as to the things that are alleged by the plaintiff in the complaint that has been filed. The second element of the cause of action that the plaintiff must prove is that the negligence was the proximate cause of the injury or the damage that was suffered by her. Then you, jury members, would go to the third element, which was that the plaintiff must also prove that it is the amount of damages that were sustained by her. The burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove the allegations which she brings to court in the complaint. Those three things are negligence, proximate cause, and damages. She must prove these things by a preponderance of the evidence. It is only possible to weigh the evidence presented to you by using your good judgment and common sense. You don't weigh it by counting up the number of witnesses that each side has because the testimony of just one witness might outweigh that of many witnesses. It is the evidence that contains and convinces you members of the jury of its truth regardless of who it came from. When I say that a person is required to prove something by the greater weight or the preponderance of the evidence, what I mean is that the evidence on the one side must be more convincing to you than it is on the other side. During my charges to you, you will hear the word negligence used by me. Negligence is a lack of care, a lack of ordinary care. It is the failure to use the ordinary care that a person under the same or similar circumstances would use. In a case like this, negligence is the failure to do that which a prudent person would do. In other words, it is the failure to do what should be done under the circumstances. I charge you that it is up to the plaintiff to prove that the defendant was negligent in at least one or more of the elements alleged in the complaint. When you read it, you will see that there is more than one act of negligence named. It isn't necessary that the plaintiff prove all of them, but it is necessary that she prove at least one of them by a preponderance of the evidence. If the plaintiff does not succeed in this, then you will have to find a verdict for the defendant. If you find that the plaintiff has proven that the defendant was negligent, then your next question would be whether or not the plaintiff has proven that the negligence was the proximate cause of the loss or the injury. What proximate cause means a cause nearest in point of time, but under the law, it means something else. Under the law means the direct cause of the loss or injury and without which it would not have happened. Now, even though you should find that the plaintiff has proven that the defendant was negligent but hasn't proven that the negligence was the proximate cause of the injury or loss, the plaintiff would have failed to make out her case and you would be required to bring in a verdict for the defendant. But if the plaintiff has proven to you, ladies and gentlemen, both the negligence of the defendant and the proximate cause, then you go to the next element, which is that the plaintiff must now prove her damages. The defendant in this case has set up a defense that we call a general denial. What is meant by that is that the defendant is denying all of the things that the plaintiff claims happened. So that puts the burden of proof on the plaintiff as 
I have just explained to you to prove the three allegations by a preponderance of the evidence. Members of the jury, this is a medical malpractice lawsuit which is defined as the failure of the defendant physician to have exercised the degree of care and skill that a physician is required to possess. I instruct you that the law does not require absolute accuracy either in practice or judgment. The law does not hold a physician to the standard of infallibility, but the law does hold a physician while in the practice of their field to the standard of care and skill possessed by other members of the same profession. The law requires that a physician use reasonable care and diligence under the circumstances that exist at that time and place. Now, let me go a bit further here to help you understand what is meant by the expression preponderance of the evidence. You will hear that term time and again throughout the trial, and it is important to know what it means. Preponderance of the evidence means that the evidence on one side has more weight in the mind of the jury than that of the other side. It doesn't mean which side calls more witnesses to the stand than the other side. Preponderance of the evidence is not the amount of witnesses on one side or the other, but the quality of their testimony. Ladies and gentlemen, if the testimony offered by the plaintiff seems to you to carry greater truth than the testimony offered by the defendant, then the requirement of preponderance of the evidence has been met and you will, we'll get ready for your Q&A. So this is going to be one minute Q&A practice before your mock, okay, you all? Let me show you this photograph and ask if you recognize this person shown here. Can you take a look at this, please? Yes, I recognize him. And who is that in the photo? He, his name is Elon Kim. Do you see Mr. Kim in the courtroom here today? Yes, I do. Would you point him out to us, please? He's sitting over there near the corner of the table. How do you know Mr. Kim? I've had contact with him before in the line of duty. Did you have any contact with Mr. Kim on March 6, 2014? Yes, I did. And in what manner did you have contact with Mr. Kim on that day? Dispatch called to tell me that they had stopped a van and they had found a body inside of the van. And that was on March 6, 2014. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What did you do after you received that information from dispatch? I got in my vehicle and drove up to South County Road. Is that where the officers had stopped the van? Yes. How long did it take you to get there? Oh, it took a little under an hour. When you arrived at South County Road, what was the location of the vehicle stop? Deputy Sanchez was there from... And then we have on your 225 Q&A mock, Exhibit F, South County Road, Mr. Elon Kim, Mr. Kim, Market Street, Deputy Sanchez, Miranda, Market Street Station, Officer, is it Kay? Keys? It's not Reyes, right. Officer Fraga, Keys, mm -hmm. and Exhibit G. And this is going to be then your 225 Q&A for your mock for five minutes, you all. And it does continue from your speed building in the middle, from your practice. Now, this picture I am showing you, Exhibit 7, where was this taken, if you know? It was taken at the scene of the vehicle stop on South County Road. Do you see Mr. Elon Kim in this photograph? Yes, I do. Does this depict how he was standing at the scene of the vehicle stop? Yes, it does. He was handcuffed there at the scene, is that correct? No, he isn't handcuffed here in the photo. Would you please describe his demeanor at the scene of the vehicle stop? As I recall, he was very quiet and calm. Did he appear to you to be intoxicated at that time? No, he did not. After you arrived at the scene, was Mr. Kim taken somewhere? Yes, he was. Do you recall where he was taken? Yes, he was taken to the station on Market Street. Who took Mr. Kim to the station? Deputy Sanchez and I took him. Do you recall how long it took you to get to the station? It took us a little over an hour. 
And that is the substation on Market Street, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Once you arrived at the station, where did Mr. Kim go? He was taken inside the station to my office. And what happened next? We sat him down and told him he was suspected of murder, and we advised him of his rights. How did you go about advising him of his rights? I read him his rights off of the Miranda card. Do you recall what time it was when you did that? I will have to check my notes in order to answer that question. Please, go ahead and check your notes. Well, it looks as though I didn't note the specific time, but it was after 10 p.m. Thank you. Do you recall who was present when you advised Mr. Kim of his rights? Deputy Sanchez was in the office with me at the time. Do you recall if anyone else was in the office with the two of you? No, it was just the two of us. Do you recall what kind of attire you were in? Yes, I was dressed in street clothes. When you say street clothes, what do you mean? I wasn't in my uniform at that time. Do you recall how Deputy Sanchez was dressed? Yes, he was in his uniform. Did the deputy have a gun with him? Yes, he did. Do you recall if his gun was ever drawn in the presence of Mr. Kim? No, he did not draw his gun. During the time that you and Deputy Sanchez and Mr. Kim were together in your office, were any guns drawn? No, they were not. Do you recall if Mr. Kim responded when you read him his rights from the Miranda Court? Yes, he did. How did he respond? He told us that he wanted to talk to a lawyer. Do you recall how he communicated that to you? Yes. He said that he thought he needed a lawyer. What if anything happened after that? I told him that he wa that was his right, that there would be no further question questions asked of him at that time. Now, did Mr. Kim stay there in your office for some period of time on March 6, 2014? Yes, he did. Do you recall how long he remained in your office that night? As I recall, he was there for several hours. Why did he have to remain in your office? We were in the middle of a shift change. As I understand it, he had to stay at the Market Street Station until the shift change occurred, and then he could be transported to the main jail. Is that correct? Yes. Where was Mr. Kim held while he waited for the shift change? He was held in my office. Do you recall if he was handcuffed at that time? I don't believe he was. During the several hours that Mr. Kim was held in your office, were there any other officers with him? Yes, there was. Do you recall who that was? Yes. By that time, Officer Keyes had arrived. Do you recall if any other officer arrived? I believe that Officer Fraga came in as well. Now, did any of you have to draw your guns during that time? No, we did not. Do you recall if Mr. Kim engaged in conversation with you at that time? Yes, he did. That was after you had advised him of his rights, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Do you recall who initiated the conversation? I believe it was Mr. Kim. Do you recall how he began the conversation with you? He started asking us if he talked to us, would it be taken out of context? How did you respond? I told him that he could have the conversation recorded. Was there a discussion about how the conversation would be taken down? Yes, we talked about it. What did you tell Mr. Kim in regard to that? I told him that I could write down what he said or that I could record it. What was his response to that? He said that he wanted his statement recorded. Did you then conduct an inter interview with Mr. Kim? Yes, I did. And did it, you record it in some manner? Yes, I used a digital recorder. Before he began to talk, did you advise him of his rights once again? Yes, I did. Do you recall how much time passed between the time Mr. Kim told you that he thought he should have a lawyer and the time the recording began? At the most, it was about an hour. This is a transcript I'm handing you. It's Exhibit G. Have you had a chance to look that over? Yes, I have. Can you tell me what that appears to be? It's a transcribed copy of the recorded statement that Mr. Kim gave. Did that transcript come into your possession at some point in time? Yes, it did. Do you recall when you first saw this transcript? I believe it was two days later. That would be March 8th, 2014, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I believe so. But you aren't 100% certain to the date, is that correct? In order to be certain, I would have to check my own notes. Why don't you take a moment and do that? All right, but it will take me more than a moment to find the date in here. Go ahead, take all the time you need. Okay, I'm done. Did you find the exact? Okay, you all, that was really, really good. Have a great day, and let me know if you have any questions. Where's this machine?